Is there a difference between the way men and women play chess? Welcome to Chess Dog. I'm John Montgomery, and it's a good question. And as it turns out, believe it or not, real conventional wisdom has developed about this question as to whether or not men and women play chess differently. I'm talking about their style of play. Uh, this isn't scientific, but the conventional wisdom says women play chess more aggressively than men do. And this has really come from looking at the top female players. Now, we can't say for sure this is even technically true, although from what I've seen, it sure does seem to be true. I uh, don't know the reason for it. Um, but I think one of the reasons why this conventional wisdom developed was because of Judith Polgar, who you very well may know. She is, there is simply no doubt, the greatest female chess player in history. And she was consistently in the world's top 10 in the, the 90s and the early aughts. Um, and she was a brilliant attacking player. I imagine she still is, even though she doesn't play in the top tournaments anymore. Um, in fact, I would say for her era, she was only second behind Garry Kasparov in terms of the brilliance of her, att her attacking uh, play. We're going to go over a game of hers against Evgeny Bereyev, played in Hastings in 1992, which was one of the really big tournaments of that era. I mean, Bereyev was a very strong, very strong player. But Judith Polgar really shows her attacking brilliance in this game. She has white. Uh, Bereyev has black. She plays e4. He played e6, the French defense, which was a common opening for him. b4, d5, knight to c3, the main line. Knight f6, bishop to g5. And in this position, black has a few choices. Bishop db4, the McCutcheon is possible. Bishop e7 is probably the, the main line. Or what Bereyev played, pawn takes pawn to relieve the pressure uh, on the center. Knight takes pawn, knight b to d7, knight f3, h6. And here, Judith Polgar plays a really great idea. Knight takes knight, Knight takes knight. Now today, this is the second most popular move, an idea in this position, uh, this next move, bishop e3, this, this structure right here. It's been played well over 850 times. But at the time of this game, this was only the third time it had been played, and the second time Judith Polgar had played it, and the only other time was a couple of, of uh, lower level masters had played it once before, and that's it. So Judith Polgar Gar really pioneered this attacking formation in this game, and it's one of the most effective formations even to this very day. Bishop to d6, if uh, Bereyev had played knight to d5 to try to, say, get that bishop off the board, then after bishop d3, knight e3, fe3, bishop d6, e4, Judith Polgar would have a very nice center and a two-to-one pawn majority in the center. So he plays bishop to d6, queen to d3. Judith Polgar clears the queen side, and uh, prepares long castling. b6. So this bishop at c8 is blocked by the pawn on e6. So Bereyev decides to develop it to b7, where it could be on the, effective on the long diagonal. The only disadvantage is that it does weaken some of these light squares on the queen side, particularly this square on c6. So Judah Polgar immediately tries to take advantage of that by playing the move knight to e5, which hits both of these key light squares. And if Bereyev were to take the knight, then after pawn takes bishop d3, knight d5, bishop to d2, uh, Judith Polgar would have a space advantage in the two bishops. And you do not give elite grandmasters a space advantage in the two bishops with nothing to show for it, or you're just going to lose. I mean, it's like, you just don't do it. So Bereyev did not do it. He played bishop to b7, putting the bishop on the long diagonal, but that allowed queen to b5 check, sort of disturbing his development. If Bereyev had played c6, Judith Polgar would have just taken the pawn, and if queen back to d7 doesn't really pin the knight, because the knight uh, could just go back to e5, the queen is protected by the bishop at f1, and it's just, it's just down a healthy pawn. Otherwise, he might have to move the king, but lose the castling rights. So he 
has to move his knight back to d7. Uh, not a move you want to play, but uh, he really felt compelled to play it. Didn't want to lose castling rights. She castles long. a6 kicks the queen back. Queen to b3. Put some pressure on this diagonal. Maybe d5 can be played at some point. Also put some x-ray pressure on the bishop at b7. And after b5, c4 uh, immediately. Because the pawn, if the pawn is taken, the bishop would be we lost. Beret of castles, f4 to further support the knight at e5. Now Bereyev plays bishop to e4, a good move. Uh, the bishop is quite effective. You'll notice all these open light squares on this diagonal, so that's definitely a nice place for the bishop. And if the bishop can retreat to the king's side, it will help in the defense of his, of his king. Uh, Judah Polgar plays c5, forcing the bishop to make a decision. He moves it back to e7. Now bishop to d3. Judah Polgar would love to keep her light-squared bishop to attack, but Bereyev's light-squared bishop is his only really great piece, so she would love to just trade off his one really nice piece. Uh, but here, he makes a risky, risky decision. Uh, Evgeny Bereyev takes the pawn at g2. Now, modern computer will tell you that this is the best move in the position. However, a computer can defend for 10, 20, 30 moves and never get tired, uh, never wear out, never make a basic tactical mistake. Human beings aren't that way. This is very dangerous because it opens up the G file leading to Black's king. And doing that against an attacking player like Judah Polgar, very dangerous. So she plays rook h to g1. And the bishop goes back to d5. It's the queen at b3, and the bishop on d5 is definitely a strong piece. It's the only really strong piece uh, black has, but it's not enough to compensate for the vulnerability of this king on the g file. No way. She plays the queen to c2, threatening to play f4, f5, which would just completely open up the king's side, and it would be just a, an annihilation after that. So Bereyev plays really the best move plays f5, blocking that diagonal. But that move creates other weaknesses in the position. It weakens g6. It, 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 it just weakens squares. So Judah Polgar immediately takes advantage of that and jumps her knight in to g6, attacking the rook at f8, putting some pressure on the bishop at e7. The rook moves to e8, and she forces the knight at d7 to make a decision. Plays c6. The knight goes to f8. If the knight had gone to f6, then she could play the knight back to e5, and then just maybe double the rooks on the g-file and have a nice attacking formation. He plays the knight back to f8 to challenge the knight and to help control that g6 square a bit. She removes the knight. She wants to keep the pieces for, for the attack. Now, Bereyev plays bishop to h4. The basic idea here is to clear out these squares so the queen can come to f6 and aid in the defense of the king. Queen to e2, threatening to come in and putting pressure on these newly weakened light squares, weakened by the move f5. Queen f6 to defend those. Queen goes to h5. The rook moves to d8. Uh, perhaps he's worried about the queen taking the rook after this mo rook moves somewhere else. Uh, but now comes the tactical hammer blow from Judith Polgar. She was known for this uh, type of chess, and uh, this is a very impressive, destructive move. Maybe you want to guess what the move is that she plays that's so destructive here. That's right. Rook takes g7 check. Bereyev retakes with the king. If he takes with the queen, then just queen to h4, and still the threat of the other rook coming to g1 is crushing, and he would have an, uh, she would have an easily winning position. So he takes with the king, but now rook to g1 check, king to h8, and now this beautiful move, knight to f7 check. Now, this does fork the king and the rook, but she's already sacrificed a rook, so she's not after that. She wants more. And after king to h7, knight to h6. And that was it. Bereyev resigned in this position after another brilliant Judith Polgar attack. Well, what happens? 
if he just takes the knight with the queen, and that makes some sense. So this is what happens. Queen to f7, check. And for king h8, rook to g8 would be checkmate. So this was a, a masterpiece, and I, I don't want to make generalizations, but uh, it is definitely conventional wisdom in chess as of now that the top women play chess more aggressively even than the top men. I ho hope you enjoyed this attacking masterpiece. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.